Hold on. <laughs> We're gonna shoot it from the back. All here. right. Have a question? Jeff, is there any, is, has there been any precedent for this to happen in any other sport that you're aware of? Absolutely. So uh, USAD has informed me that they reached out to other professional sports organizations who have had the exact same issue. Um, because of collective bargaining issues, they, they don't want it to, to be public about it. But there's another professional sports league out there that's had this issue pop up multiple times, and they've handled their adjudication the same way that you saw to handle John's is that the, the individual is punished under strict liability or the individuals under strict liability the first time through. And as long as the science showed still residual effect in subsequent tests, they were not punished again. Um, it's, it's really a, a matter of double jeopardy. Um, go ahead. I think there's been a baseball player, uh, Cody Stanley. Did you ever hear about his case? Or yeah, I, I don't know about him specifically, but again, you know, um, I'm aware there's multiple instances in other sports in the Olympic world too. And then uh, we've actually had one in the UFC. So uh, Grant Dawson, who uh, was a winner on the Contender Series, Dana gave a contract to. His first test under USADA program was positive for low level N3 metabolites. What's required for new fighters is that they disclose going back a year any supplements medications, et cetera, that they've taken. So initially, you saw to made the ruling, well, this somehow showed up. You didn't disclose what caused this over the last year. And then in reconsidering over these last several months, talking to experts, other professional sports leagues, they said they couldn't rule out that whatever caused that happened more than a year ago. And so Grant was basically, um, you know, deemed eligible right away and there was ultimately no sanction there. The, the amount of time. The surprise to me yesterday was the other two tests. That uh -huh. Why did we not hear about those? Why was it just yesterday you know, that we finally heard that he had yeah. two other atypical findings? Yeah, well, again, when, when you have an atypical finding like that, the typical um, you know, course of action is USADA evaluates it. They investigate it. And this wasn't an easy investigation. They, you know, they took together experts from all around the world, is my understanding, talked to other professional sports leagues. Um, and so you know, when you have an atypical finding, um, until that's you know, resolved, it's not typically disclosed. There was no commission under which the jurisdiction fell. Um, you know, these were tests from several months ago. So Nevada considers, I think, 45 to 60 days out to be their jurisdiction. But nevertheless, out of an abundance of caution, USADA did notify Nevada in early December of this issue. So very early December, they got a letter saying, look, you have these two very low level, atypical findings in August, September followed by four negatives. We just want to put this on your radar. We have one more outstanding test, which will turn around and expedite as fast as we can and get to you. But just so you know, this is an issue. Thus far, we have deemed this not to be uh, a subsequent violation. And the experts are, are telling USADA that this is residual from the time before. There's no evidence of any further readministration. Do you feel, because I think everybody's biggest thing is transparency, right? And, and I know it's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Like you don't want people guilty before being innocent. Correct. And, but, it just feels weird, you know, when we're December, we're days out from fighting, we're just now hearing about months old tests. Do you feel that there's a better way to handle this, that there's a way to be more transparent? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a slippery slope. And as you all know, our original um, policy was we announced potential violations. And, and I'll be the first to admit that was the wrong call. You know, you had instances of potential violations and then that narrative is set and stays with that athlete forever. And despite the fact that down the line, it's determined to be non-intentional contaminated supplements. So it is, I mean, it's, it's a slippery slope and it's, you know, it's a balancing act between as much transparency, but also, you know, fairness and uh, due process to the athletes. So uh, I'm confident that you saw to handle it at the right time this time through. The so opinion what about consistency and in application, the only other thing I hear the real big complaint is that other people have tested for the same substance in, in similar levels and have gotten different amounts. You know, you've heard Frank Meir come out and talk about it. We've heard Tom Lawler talk about it. How do you address that? There, there, there seems to be no real consistency. Simple. Like it's very, it's different. very consistent. John was sanctioned the first time it showed up in his system, sanctioned for 15 months for what you know McLaren ultimately determined was non-intentional use. So those out there that's saying that John got off scot-free, I mean, an independent arbitrator determined that he didn't do anything on purpose. It was however it got into his system. He still got 15 months. Frank Mir, this wasn't the second occasion where there were still remnants from the first time. He was sanctioned via strict liability. 
Same with Tom Lawler. Now, Tom, Frank Muir, at least what they had in common, it was the same substance, but Tom Lawler's was a completely different substance, Osterine. We're not talking about long-term metabolites that stick around. We're talking about the parent compound, you know, a SARM, which is anabolic steroid-like. So apples and oranges. So those that are comparing these cases, there's no case that's truly like John's, where he's already been sanctioned, and then it re, you know, reappeared, and the experts determined it was still from the same sanction. It's classic double jeopardy clause. You don't punish someone twice for the same you know, action. But the opinion that it is double jeopardy, I mean, how can that be said? There's no like scientific papers that have been written to say that this thing can actually last 17 well, or 18 months. Correct. But, you know, you have to look at this compound. And, and again, these are what the, I'm relying on the experts that you saw that accumulated. I'm not a scientist. I'm a, a finance accounting background. Papers, don't you need to uh, consider that? The well, that, that's a question a that you need to ask USADA. I mean, they're the ones that I, I've had some very absolute statements from three of the top anti-doping experts I'd consider in the world, that all of them said there is no evidence of reingestion, and there is also, maybe imp most importantly, no evidence that he would retain any performance enhancing benefit tomorrow night. And so, I mean, I've got to rely on those, and I'm confident in those scientists and their opinion. Aren't those experts all linked to USADA, though? No, not necessarily. Smirtle, Daniel, Dr. Daniel Eichner is one of them. He runs the Salt Lake City Testing Laboratory. Now, USADA uses his laboratory to conduct tests, but he's not a USADA employee. All he sees when it comes into the laboratory is numbers. It could be an NFL test, a Major League Baseball test, an Olympic test, a UFC test. And as he's analyzing these numbers, he didn't know who it belonged to. Um, so I, I'm very confident in, in, in Dr. Eichner's mm -hmm. ability and expertise. Jeff, who are the other experts? Uh, Dr. Larry Bowers. Dr. Bowers was formerly uh, ran the United States or International Olympic Committee Testing Laboratory at Indiana University. He then went on to become the chief science um, officer at USADA, is now retired. He no longer works for USADA. He's an independent uh, consultant. And then the last one is uh, Dr. Matthew Fedoric. He's USADA's current science director. What are they saying to you? How do they know definitively that this is not a new ingestion? Where's the side? Because I saw what Eichner wrote. He said most likely. Right? So, you know, I think, and again, I would encourage all of you to reach out to USADA and, and talk to these experts, but I think it's primarily based on the paper that came out in 2012 by the Russian doctor. Um, and he basically did some studies, my understanding, on himself. He was actually ingesting oral terinobol himself and submitting urine samples and testing them. And he identified up to 50 different metabolites from this. And if you read the paper, there is a certain, I think he calls it a midterm metabolite, which he definitively said, look, this metabolite's available 22 days in the body or in the urine after ingestion. John's, you know, had several positive tests that were within that 22 day window that never showed those shorter midterm metabolites. So only the long-term metabolite would show. So, so the theory is that if it was re-ingestion or recent ingestion, you're A, gonna either see the parent compound B, going to see the short-term metabolite, or C, going to see this documented 22-day lasting long uh, mid-term metabolite, and those were never found. Only this long-term metabolite was found, and that's consistent, as I said earlier, with these other cases in other sports, in the Olympic sports, they're seeing this commonly occur now. Given, given your role, uh, you guys were first notified about this particular test on December 20th, is that accurate? I think that sounds right. The days are kind of run together over these last week. Is it fair that Alexander Gustafson finds out through the media about this? Why, should, why, why is he the last to know? Shouldn't he have found out when you guys found out? So we wanted to resolve this issue and not, you know, part of, part of I think our decision making here was to cause as little stress as possible on the, on the athletes on the card. So we wanted to make sure that we had things resolved in terms of whether, where this fight was going to occur, where it was going to occur. And so, you know, as soon as that decision was made, every effort was, you know, made to contact Gus immediately. He happened to be on a helicopter ride in, in the Grand Canyon. As soon as he landed, he came directly to the office. So, I, I mean, I think it was the right call in order to work things out before, you know, we burdened him with this. And look, I, <laughs> there's no doubt about it. I mean, this is a stressful thing for, I think, everybody. When I get the call from USADA in normal course of events, they'll call me. They'll tell me about the athlete. The first thing I ask is what's the drug, what's the level, 
and I have this tidal wave of thoughts that go through my mind. How is this going to play out? And literally, I sit at my desk maybe for five minutes or so, hand in my, you know, head in my hand, like, okay, here's how this is going to go. And I, you know, all these things that you guys are asking and talking about and stress on the athlete, I saw this coming with this one. This isn't, you know, optically not a, not a pretty picture again, but I stand up here 100% confident and you saw it as decision making and these experts that they have and, and I believe this is the right thing to do, this fight going on tomorrow. When you have to figure out if the first uh, adverse finding death was in August. Correct. Was there any way to get that information from Nevada sooner? I, mean, I think the fight was announced in, in October. In hindsight, maybe you guys could have brought information sooner so this didn't have to happen at the last minute. Yeah, well, again, I think when the way USADA adjudicates the program is they're very conscious of the fairness and due process afforded the athletes. And that I take a lot of pride in that. I mean, I say this very often that <laughs> Having a strong, comprehensive program is important, but just as important as being fair and having due process afforded to the athletes. So I think in their thought that if they notified Nevada of this right away, when they had even an inkling that, hey, maybe this is an issue, a remnant issue, it's not a subsequent violation, they've got to be very careful because, you know, a commission could go off on their own and use that, you know, adversely against the athletes. So again, yeah, I mean, ideally, would we have liked to have had it earlier? Yes, but they took a lot of care and consideration and reaching out to experts and vetting all the issues out here. And again, I think they did the right Is thing. Is there still a chance that Nevada could come to a different conclusion than you? Sure. I mean, they, they can. They're an independent entity and they have, you know, their own adjudication regulations. Um, we sat down with them last week going over these things. I mean, my impression coming away is they began to understand the science. Dr. Eichner, you know, Nevada's used him as one of their experts in subsequent hearings. They know his credentials, and he has very absolute statements in writing about, you know, no evidence of reingestion and no performance enhancing benefits. So I think, you know, there's somewhat of a comfort level, but they didn't have the ability, they weren't afforded what California had been. California obviously had two public trials involving John. You know, over the last 18 months, Andy Foster has been intimately familiar with this case, with the drug, with the metabolites. He understood it intimately. So it made a lot of sense that, you know, Andy would have the ability to look at these experts and look at the numbers and the tests and make a quick decision. USADA felt that they needed, a, or I'm sorry, Nevada felt that they needed a little bit more time. They did afford us the, the opportunity. They said, hey, we can do a hearing before that. You still want to, you know, try to put this fight in Nevada. But I think the earliest they were able to do it would have been Thursday or Friday. And, you know, hey, this is an issue you got to talk to Dana and or Hunter in, but they didn't feel comfortable with those contingencies of having that hearing that late in the game. So what's yeah, the that, 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 you had a treatment, especially when you consider that the possibility of micro dosing and when you consider that the steroid just being existed in the body. Let me, let me address microdosing. Fact, I, months before. Yeah. They take it months before. It still can have an effect. Let me address microdosing. And, you know, there's a lot of keyboard scientists out there, you know, throwing stuff out there that you got to be careful about looking at. So microdosing, and I've, I've had a lot of personal experience with that in my previous career, you know, the cycling investigations, baseball players, microdosing is done with steroids that are endogenous to your body, that appear in your body. Testosterone, EPO, human growth hormone, take it in very small amounts, um, and basically you microdose so that that clears quickly and or is disguised in your biological passport. Um, to microdose a oral terinobol, oral terinobol, no matter what, how low of a dose you take, is still gonna produce those metabolites. They'll be in very low quantity, but I think the, the research and the evidence that's out there show that they're still gonna last as long as that metabolite is going to last. And you see the levels here, and there's you know, a lot of talk about what a picogram really means. It's a super, super low level. Um, the WADA standard, there's a technical document that WADA puts out, which all WADA accredited labs, it's mandatory that they detect steroids down to a certain level. And that level that all WADA labs must you know, meet is two nanograms. So that's you know, 2,000 times more than a picogram. What you're seeing now is it literally an arms race amongst laboratories. Who can detect the lowest? And you know these laboratories are private entities are trying to attract business. So to sell out there, hey, I can detect down to one picogram, come to me. You'll be able to know everything that this subject did the last year or two. And that's what you see. And I think you've got to be careful. When I started in this, in this game 17 years ago, 
I'll be the first to admit, the science and the testing was so far behind people using these substances, it was ridiculous. It was very easy to get away with it. I think, in a sense, that pendulum has maybe swung too far now. The level of sensitivity is so great that you've got to be really, really careful, really responsible and objective in looking at each individual test. There's, there's document, documented instances of environmental contaminations out there that are causing athletes. And I'm not saying this, this is John's case, but it's just a good example. Drugs in water supplies. A lot of commonly prescribed drugs are often flushed down the toilet. They're showing up in certain water supplies. Certainly, WADA labs can now detect at the picogram level and find that out. So you've got to be really careful to differentiate the intentional cheater and user and those that were, you know, non-intentional. this is a guy who's tested positive before, so why do you give him the benefit of the doubt and are the standards different between him and an undercard fighter? So, no, again, I gave okay. Grant Dawson as the example. Grant Dawson's never had a UFC fight. He won the Contender Series, got a contract, and his, you know, they took a look at his testing history and what he said, and he was treated exactly the same as John. They said this isn't a subsequent violation. So my answer would be absolutely no on that. This would be the same as, as everybody on the roster, the way that you saw to analyze this. So have there been any studies with the long-term metabolite of Terenobol this been this far along like John's? Here's the problem with, with Terenobol. It's not approved and it's illegal for humans to consume it. And I know here in the United States, but in, in my experience, anywhere in the world. So you can't ethically have a medical study on a drug that's not approved for medical use. Rachenkov, the, the Russian doctor who did it, administered it to himself, um, and that was the basis of that study. So I'm not aware that it could ever be, you know, widely distributed and the study can be conducted. So basically, you know, if that's not the case, then you have to use other methods, which is my understanding is what these experts have done. They've looked at other test data, reached out to other sports and other athletes, and came up with this conclusion. You have heard from athletes who have sort of said, look, the stuff's in your system or it's not. Our understanding has always been that there's zero tolerance and that this sort of feels like, like a change in, in that policy on some level. What do you say to them? Well, I, I mean, just look at the scenario. So you have, and let's, let's take John out of the equation. Let's say that I you know, go to the gym and drink my training partner's protein shake and there happens to be a small amount of oral terinobol in it. Gets in my system. Um, and I'm tested and I'm sanctioned, but ultimately, and again, this is just, I'm not saying this is the case, but let's just say in theory, there's some dynamics where this metabolite stays with you forever, forever. So you guys answer that question. Do you think I should never be allowed to fight again? I don't think that's fair. I mean, uh, so I think you've got to objectively look at each independent case on its own set of facts. And again, based on, you know, what these experts are telling me, and that's all I can rely on them, they're saying there's zero evidence that he did anything wrong again. He's already been punished. I mean, you look at both of John's cases, Richard McLaren, maybe the most credible anti-doping guy in the world and or his group, in both written um, decisions said that John, non, you know, obviously John be the first to admit he made some lifestyle you know, mistakes that probably could have avoided this, but in both instances, they determined this was non-intentional. Despite that, John's been suspended for two and a half years, just presented a $200,000 plus check to the state of California. He's probably lost out on tens of millions of dollars. Those that are out there saying that John's being let off easy, holy smokes. I mean, the heart of probably, you know, his career as an athlete, he sat on, on and again, I'm not saying that's wrong. There is strict liability in this. You need to have a deterrent so that people are careful about those decisions that they make in their life. Um, but I think a two and a half year suspension and you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in fine and lost income of likely tens of millions of dollars for John is a, a severe punishment and a deterrent for others looking at his case. Regardless of even punishment though, I mean, it is an athlete with a banned substance that's been found in their system who's being allowed to compete. I mean, isn't it, isn't it more concerned for the other athletes? Yeah, again, I think it's very unique to this M3 long-term metabolite. I don't think you can just group all banned substances and make that, oh, he's got a banned substance. It is a very specific, very strange acting long-term metabolite. The parent compound is a thing that makes you recover quicker, stronger, you know, potentially faster. I don't think there's any evidence out there that this M3 metabolite has those effects in the body. It's just a sign in the body that there was a past ingestion 
of the oral terinimal. So at the press conference yesterday, John actually said that the, the amount was so low that he was almost frustrated that it did become public. With you saying that you feel the pendulum has swung the other way, mm -hmm. is there a thought that maybe the sensitivity is too high that you know the standards, should, the threshold should be higher? And mm -hmm. Should the public know about this in, yeah. in, in an effort of transparency? So the World Anti-Doping Agency, so the WADA code is basically the code that most world anti-doping agencies follow. And this is public, you can go to their website. They've identified that this is a problem. They currently have a working group of experts throughout the world determining, hey, do we need to set thresholds for some of these substances? Like, what do we really do in testing below, you know, 50 picograms? Our laboratories are only required to detect down to two nanograms. What are we really doing at 50 picograms? So they're actually, they had their first meeting last week, and the UFC fully plans, if this working group of experts come out with some of these numbers, we fully plan to implement it. Uh, WADA is typically a little bit slow to react. I think their next code revision is in 2021. You know, my feeling overseeing this program is that's way too long to wait. We need to, to figure out this, this scenario um, and, and get a solution to it right now. Is that come at a danger of potentially allowing microdosing? Ag or yeah, that? again, I'm relying on these experts. These experts, USADA, WADA, I mean, their whole existence is protecting the rights of clean athletes. And so I fully expect when they come you know, with some type of decision, there will be things built in to ensure that they're not missing out on the tail end of a microdosing cycle or the tail end that, you know, there just hasn't been a test collected. And this is someone who used something five or six months ago, and that's why they're down low. So I fully expect whatever their recommendations are that that's going to, you know, cover that scenario and protect against that happening. Now, the LA John Times just recently, uh, October 2017 and August 2018. And the reason why that long, long time Say that again, Mark? John wasn't tested. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was a long gap. And look, I don't I don't get involved in in the testing protocol or decision making of USADA. You know, my guess as I stand here now is they probably saw him facing a, a pretty lengthy su uh, suspension, unfortunately. And, and in fact, news came out like we're upping our testing numbers, um, but we still have a limited limited amount of tests. So when when USADA is, I think, making that decision on who they're going to throw those tests at, you know, they want to throw the majority of those that are going to be fighting upcoming, you know, close. And so I think part of their decision making is, well, he's likely going to be on the beach for at least a year. Um, what's the best use of the resources now? And as you saw, as we got closer in the summer, what they told me just the other day is, you know, numbers wise, he's probably, if not the most, one of the most tested athletes in the UFC over the last, you know, six months. Are they testing him this week? There was some reports that Vada is only doing it, USADA is not. Is that true? Uh, no, I'm not aware of that, um, but I am aware that he's, he's now subject to two programs. That was part of his condition with uh, Andy licensing him that he had to sign up for the VADA program, and he completed all that paperwork yesterday um, and is fully enrolled in the VADA program as well as the USADA program right now. Did California know when they licensed him on, on December 11th that he had those previous infractions, the one in August? Were they aware? No, of they, they didn't. Um, you, Nevada knew at that time, but California didn't. Um, USADA, you know, they reached out to. to yeah, I mean, hey, in, in hindsight, maybe. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm you know. that would have changed the course of all of this. I'm, I'm definitely a, a proponent of as much transparency as possible. Unfortunately, like, how do you think of, you know, every scenario? I think USADA, in USADA's mind, they had no obligation to let Nevada know about this at all. I mean, it wasn't within their jurisdiction. I think out of an abundance of caution, they did it. Um, yeah, could they have given it to Andy as well? You know, potentially, but. Correct me if I'm wrong, on Sunday when you guys uh, met with some members of the media, you said this was the first time it popped up, but then yesterday you said, obviously it wasn't. Why did you say that on Can Sunday? Can you say that again? I said. You guys met with the media on Sunday, right? Okay, yep. I recall you and Dana White saying this is the first time it's come up in a test. I don't remember saying that. The first time it's come up in a test being the December 12th test or yeah, the, the December 9th, 9th test. I, I, I recall you as being added. If I said that, I misspoke because okay. obviously I knew I knew early December when we were CC'd on the notification to Nevada that there had been these issues in August and I think early September. Do you know why they released it, the test in December and they didn't, you know, released earlier ones? What was it about December's test that they would release those? Well, I mean, December's test clearly fell in the jurisdiction of Nevada, that Nevada basically tells USADA, look, once a fight's announced in Nevada, any testing results that you get from participants in that Nevada fight, we want, because we feel we have jurisdiction over that as well. So 
Sure. That's why they do okay, that. Just a couple sure. more questions. Yeah. Sure. Is it, isn't like a good way to characterize maybe the problem here is the dual jurisdiction? And is there any way to fix that? So you see that as a problem? Or what do you mean? Well, if there's only just one entity yeah. in charge of these results and then sanctioning it, when you, when you have two, that's when you have you know, situations like that, that make this possible, where, where Nevada is, is all of a sudden getting tests from another entity that they weren't, they weren't aware of yeah. initially, and then they're on a time frame. Like, is there any way, is the dual, well, I guess in your opinion, is the yeah. dual jurisdiction a problem? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a it's a problem. I mean, it it is a challenge. But you know, one of the issues and the reason that Lorenzo and Dana wanted this program is, you know, our fighters aren't necessarily subject to a commission's jurisdiction all year round, and they wanted to be able to test our fighters when they didn't have a fight upcoming any one of 365 days a year. So in order to do that, you have to retain you know an, an independent entity like USADA to do that. Um, as you come close to a fight, you come into the jurisdiction of a, of a certain state. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that you know USADA is going to be willing to to run a program and, and give that up. Um, I'm I'm very comfortable in USADA just because of their experience and their reputation worldwide. It gives me great comfort that hopefully a lot of these commissions can work with them, and they have historically. There's been some real good cooperation where offline and not involving USC, I'm UFC. We're not involved whatsoever in deliberations or um, adjudicating cases but there are typically they do you know talk offline and you know I think there's there's mutual interest to come up with you know at least a reasonably comparable um, sanction to avoid you know wide disparities yeah, even though you are to me though that you know with this, to, to, not to rehash what, what Ariel said but um, if you if you're sanctioning John mm -hmm. in California based on a USADA test and that process is still playing out, and then there's another USADA test that pertains to John, but then they aren't even made aware of it. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a poor system, is it not? Yeah, I mean, you, you'd have to ask USADA their, their rationale behind that. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have an answer to that right now. Even though we're, we're confident uh, in the decision-making here, what, with all this happening so fast, weren't you uh, worried that it, this will, would tarnish the legacy of UFC, USADA, and yourself, as a lot of people say, the average fan I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, you've got you've to gotta take them as they come, and not everything it works out perfectly in this business. Believe me, I know of, of anyone else. So, you know, and I, I experienced this, you know, in my previous career as well, and with, you know, controversy and criticism, et cetera. And so what, you know, what I do and what you have to do is just put your nose down and take, you know, each, each situation, in fact, as it comes and evaluate that, and that's what we did here. And yeah. And, playing, you know, Monday morning quarterback. Could there have been things that were done, you know, a little bit differently? Possibly, but I think everybody, all sides, certainly the UFC, certainly USADA, certainly the Nevada Commission, California Commission are all trying to do the right thing, trying to be fair to the athletes, and they're also, you know, trying to protect those clean athletes and clean sport. Jeff, when USADA announced Jones' sanction back, I guess, in September, the, the main thing they said was he got reduced from four years to 18 months due to substantial assistance. Mm -hmm. Pretty much means he's cooperating on another case, criminal act, or whatever. Um, what is your knowledge of that, and is that still ongoing? Is he still cooperating if you saw it on Yeah, case? so for, for this very reason, Mark, I insulate myself 100% from substantial assistance. So I'm aware via McLaren's public decision that that was the case for reduction, but I don't know anything. And I literally I know nothing about what that assistance uh, entails. Only John and you saw to know that, so that would be a question to them. Um, you know, I dealt in my previous career with these issues, and again, you have to weigh transparency with other factors here. And look, I think if you're transparent about substantial assistance, you're never going to get any substantial assistance in the future. And clearly, substantial assistance, I saw this, you know, in, in the criminal world, is an effective tool in anti-doping. Um, testing alone is not good enough. You need the investigative side of things. The biggest cases in the world, many of which I was a part of, weren't the result of drug testing. They were the result of an investigation. So it's a very important factor, but I don't know anything about the extent of John's substantial assistance. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. One more question, gang. How does it work with the blood test protocol? Because once, once you guys announced that you saw the program, you guys said that you could go back and recheck tests that were done before, right? Okay. Did you guys retest anything about, like, John Jones? Uh, absolutely. So, and again, you know, USADA doesn't share all those, but I, I can almost guarantee you that, you know, it's not every sample, but many of the samples that USADA collects are frozen and kept, uh, I think, up to 10 years 
for cases just like this. If something pops up and it will be valuable for them to go back a year and two years, especially as testing becomes more sensitive, hey, let's see what came up you know, a couple years ago. So again, we're talking about that gap between the August and September tests in early November, I can almost guarantee you things like that were going on, retesting of old samples now that the sensitivity level has increased. So I think that probably factored into those experts' decisions. But so in, those, in this case, for example, those tests, they are not released, right? They are just for these other two. Yeah, I mean, well, if, if there was an adverse finding in one of those, they went back and found, hey, now that the sensitivity level is kicked up and there's something that showed up that would trigger another, you know, potential suspension, that definitely would be disclosed. So going forward, Last one, what Scott. changes do you see taking place and how the testing's done or what would you like to see take place? Well, we're, we're doing, I think, three main things that hopefully are going to address and hopefully minimize these issues in, uh, going forward. Number one, our increase in testing. Look, the reality is if John, especially the July 2017, if he had not had those negative tests on July 8th or July 7th and July 8th, I don't think there would have been a way for, you know, you saw it in the science to show that this wasn't, this was non-intentional ingestion. I think actually more testing acts to protect our fighters. Uh, secondly, I mean, a big issue that we see, a lot of these low levels are due to supplement contaminations, and it's maybe the most common question I get. These athletes say, hey, what supplements are USADA approved? And my answer is, well, USADA doesn't approve any supplements, but as soon as I say they don't approve any supplements, everything else I say goes in one ear and out the other. They want to hear from me, what supplements am I allowed to use that USADA approves? We are, uh, I think, early next year going to have an approved line of supplements that basically will tell our athletes, use these, if anything happens in one of these and we can prove it came from it, it's basically a get out of jail free card. I mean, you may have to sit on the sideline while whatever was in there clears your system, but it's a get out of jail free card. Major League Baseball has done that. In comparison, we had, I think, 2,800 tests last year. Baseball did 12,000. They had zero contaminated supplement cases. So look at that because they have an approved line of supplements that all their players know. These are approved by baseball. I can use these. I think that'll go a long way. Uh, in solving that and then obviously the last issue is going to be you know the, the threshold issue and taking the recommendations of, of that working group I just have two quick, very quick questions on you. quick yes very quick. all right you announced yesterday that you re-upped the deal right yep when did that deal get consummated the new deal recently a couple weeks ago um, the timing is a funny one no but nothing to do with no. with any of this stuff we've been in you know talks and negotiations with them so our First deal expires December 31st, so this has played out over the last six months at least. We just some things were, were working out in it and came to you know a conclusion at that time. So there was nothing behind the the timing of that announcement at all. I, have to ask, uh, I thought it was one quick one. No, I said two quick ones. Okay. The guy you've been or will forever be linked with, Lance Armstrong, has yeah. been vocal about you this week. Yeah. Anything you'd like to say in response to some of the things he said? Uh, Lance about you? Armstrong is probably one of the biggest frauds and cheats in professional sport. And he's out there making judgments, you know. Again, I think he's the least credible guy to, to make those types of judgments. Um, these same experts that are, you know, doing these studies and, and, and putting out these, these facts um, are the ones that basically exposed him as the biggest fraud in sports. So in my mind, that guy has no credibility. He can say whatever he wants to say. I don't pay him any attention. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Yeah, uh, so I think the USADA, USADA approved supplements as going forward are going to be third party certified and tested supplements. So basically, you know, in the case of him or anybody who has a supplement company, once we adopt, whether it's Inform Sport, NSF, that approval company, anyone that has a supplement company can go to them, get it approved by them, and therefore it will be approved under our program. Thanks, Thanks guys.